All right. So um, today I want to introduce a different kind of loop. Uh, last time we talked about the while loop. This time we're going to talk about something called a for loop. I'm going to go through that and then I'm going to intro the next assignment, uh, A5, which is an ATM machine simulator. So, um, and I'm actually going to go through an example that parallels that assignment so you can kind of see how the code is developed and how it's put together in a, a little bit simpler way. I'm not going to give you the answer, of course, but I will show you how, how something similar to that would function so that you can get an idea of what the code looks like. So for loops are the second kind of loop, the original, of course, being the while loop. Uh, just to review, a while loop has the word while and then some expression that evaluates to true or false. Uh, if you put the word true here as a Boolean value with a capital T, it's just going to infinite loop until you break out of that loop. Of course, every while loop has a colon at the end of the while line, and then the code block that gets executed as part of that loop is all indented. So this one will, of course, print it's still true forever until you break that cycle or until it encounters a break statement or until the computer dies. In this case, we have another example of a while loop, which starts with an x equals one, and then the while condition is while x is less than four, it will execute these two lines of code, which you can see are both indented at the same level beneath the while expression. So this will print it's still true, comma x, and then it will add one to the value of x. So let's take a quick look at this in context. I'm going to copy and paste that code directly into uh, my editor here. And one thing I want to point out, this is a good opportunity to do so, is that while this appears to be valid code, it's underlined. Can anybody tell me why it's underlined? It's tricky. First time this happened to me, it even took me a minute to find to figure it out. Right here? That does not make a difference. It's very subtle. In fact, I'm not even sure you'd be able to see it before I point it out. They're smart quotes. Actually, no, they're, neither is upside down. These are called smart quotes, which is a different character altogether from the regular vertical quotes that we use in Python. So if I change this to a regular quote, you can see that goes away. So just be aware that if you're copying and pasting from a word processor or PowerPoint or something like that, that actually uses rich text or has some kind of autocorrect feature, that it may introduce smart quotes, which could cause problems in your code. So back to the while loop here, if I execute this, you can see it runs through the loop three times because starting at one, okay, so x equals one here, one is less than four, it goes through prints it's still true one, it adds to the value, goes through, two is less than four, so it prints it's still true, two, right? Adds one, three, still still less, so it prints it again, and then it gets to here, adds one, and it becomes, x becomes four. When it comes back to here, x is no longer less than four, so it stops the loop at that point, because that becomes false. X is not less than four at that point. So a for loop is different than a while loop, okay? It no longer deals with a true or false condition. Instead, it takes a set of data and goes through each piece of that data, assigning it to a variable, and then using that variable in some kind of a code block here below. So for example, in this one, we're take saying x for each x in the range of 0 to 6, do this. 
So we'll do that with each X. Let's take a look at that in the editor so we can see how that works. For X in range, zero comma six. Oops, too many commas there. Okay, so if I run that, notice it counts zero, one, two, three, four, five as it prints each time, each for each X in this range, print X. Why is it not printing six? Because the range function specifies a set of numbers that starts here, includes that, but stops at whatever point is before six. So it does not include that higher range. If I want it to say the number six, then I would change the range to seven. And then when I run it, it will include six. So that's just something to remember in your head. Another way to look at this is the range argument only requires one argument. If you put only one argument, it will start at zero and end before that number. If I wanted to go from 10 to 20, or 10 to 19 rather, I could do that. Another way to look at range is to add a third argument and that is the multiple that it will use to count. So if I write in range zero comma 30 comma three, it's gonna count from zero to 30 by threes, of course, stopping at whatever number is before 30, which would be 27. If I go 31, then it will go all the way to 30 because it will stop at whatever the last number is before the one I specify, even though 31 is not a multiple of three. So that's useful. You can use it to count. I can even use that in an F string like this. My favorite number is X. So now it'll substitute that number into that F string every time it prints it through. Okay. So that's what, that's one way of looking at four. Another way of looking at four is to use a data type that we have not encountered yet, but we will very soon. It's called a list. And it allows you to take one variable and assign more than one value to it in a list. So the nice thing about a list is that it groups all of those things together and then I can do things with them. But in this case, I can do what's called iteration. So if I have a list called fruits, and you can recognize that it's a list because it's got brackets around it like this. Apple, orange, banana, okay? And then if I wanna print something with each of those fruits, I would just say, I can say for str fruit in fruits, print, okay, so that'll print each of those fruits on its own row. And we can do lots and lots of things with lists. We can add to them, we can modify them. So once we get into list variables, it opens up a whole new world of fun that we can have. So that is the introduction of for loops. We're gonna use for loops quite a bit moving forward. But for this assignment, all you really need is a while loop. And this adds a fair amount of complexity to what we've been doing so far. I want you to create an ATM machine simulator 
that allows you to deposit and withdraw money from two different accounts, a saving, a savings account and a checking account. So you have to keep track of the balance of each of those accounts using variables. And you will need to also um, keep, you know, keep track of things like does the user, if they want to withdraw money from an account, does that account have more money in it than they want to withdraw? Because obviously you can't take $500 out of a bank account that only has $100 and things like that. So here are some considerations I want you to focus on as we do this. Balance can't go below zero. I'd like you to try using the string dot r just for, uh, function to format your your currency amounts so that if you have a list of currency you have them justified to the right so that the uh, decimals line up that makes the UI look good also think about things with UI like how your users are going to interact what you're telling them what's easier for them what's user friendly that sort of thing after each transaction, I want you to ask the user, this is where the loop comes in, I want you to ask the user if they'd like another transaction. It's sort of similar to the would you like to play again concept that we just talked about with the, when we practiced this on Monday. Uh, make sure you keep track of the amount in each account using a variable for each account. Um, the whole time while the program runs. You don't have to store what the amount is after the program quits. It can always start, whenever you run the program, it can always start with $100 in each account or whatever. And it, won't, it doesn't need to be persistent after the program quits. We'll learn how to do that in the near future, but not yet. And then uh, I'd recommend starting with some money in each account. So while I'm not going to tell you the answers to the ATM project, I'm going to give you an idea of how this might work. Using the construct of a marble jar, okay, and I'm going to keep track. Let's pretend like I've got a marble jar that's got red and blue marbles in it. So I'm going to start out with 10 marbles in each color inside that jar. And I'll say welcome to the marble jar sim. And I'll have two empty lines after that. And then I'll say print what would you like to do? Okay, so let's first thing I need to do is see if I'd like to add or take away marbles. Okay, so let's do that. And I'm going to do my main menu should be input. I'm going to say add or take away marbles and based on that I'm going to do a menu branch so the first thing I want to do is if str menu equals add or a and then I'm going to do a branch that says L if str menu equals take away and then all other input is invalid. So I'm going to say print invalid input. Okay. Now that's my main structure. Remember how I talk about going from big to specific. So my main structure is here. If I want to add, I need to I need to say number one thing, 
what color am I going to add? And number two thing is what, how many am I going to add? So, so str color equals, do you want to add red or blue? Oh, I got to do input there. Input, because I'm getting input, and then str how many. Keeping my camel case there. Input how many. And then I need to change that. To, a, to an int, right, because it's a string. Now, if I wanted to be really careful about this, I'd probably want to do some checking to make sure that they actually entered a number before I try and convert it to an int. Otherwise, I could crash the program. But for this purpose, I'm just going to assume that the user is smart and they know what they're, and they know how to do this. All right. So now I'm going to branch based on what color they wanted to add. So I'm going to say if str color equals red, then I'm going to say int red equals int red plus int how many, right? And then I'm going to say lf str color equals blue int blue equals int blue plus int how many. And then else I'm going to go invalid input again. Okay, so there is my add. Now I need to do takeaway. And I can get the same thing here. Copy. I can use those questions again, except I want to take it away. Right, and how many. I can also use this copy. Now, look it. Right here, I've got to figure out the easiest way to check and make sure that. I'm not trying to take more marbles out of the jar than are in the jar for each color. So I could, inside this, before I take it away, because obviously I'm going to have this kind of an action happening, right? But before I do this, I have to make sure that, it, that I have enough in there. So I could, I could put another if statement in here. Or... Another way that I could approach this that's kind of interesting is by using the Boolean operator and, or the logical operator and, and int red is greater than int how many. So if both of these things are true, then it will take away the red. And int blue, if both of these things are true, then it will do that. So the only thing I need to do is change this or
Okay, so now it will say the only thing that's that's the this is a much easier and it's far less code, but the only thing here is that the user is a, has a little bit of ambiguity. Did I enter the wrong thing or do I not have enough marbles? So that's the downside. I could write more code in here and give them a more precise feedback message if I wanted to. But that does accomplish the task. So now I've done the transactions. Let's try it out. Okay, I want to add marbles. Do I want to add red or blue? Red, 10. Okay, so it seems to have worked, but I don't know if it worked yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, at this very outside level, I'm going to print, you have in red marbles. Actually, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Num number of red marbles in red. And then I'll do the same thing with blue here. Blue. Okay. So I'm going to add marbles. I'm going to add red, add 10. Okay, so it's doing my math right. That's nice. Now let's add the, would you like another transaction? So the first thing I want to do is turn this into a loop. And I'm going to put it right here after the welcome because we only welcome people once. So I'm going to go while true and then I want to show you a little trick that you can use in PyCharm if I highlight a whole block of code like this and I hit tab I can indent the whole block of code all at once shift tab goes the opposite direction so that's a, a nice little feature there and I want to I'm going to do this. What would you like to do? Just going to do a little bit of playing around with the interface here. And then I'm going to say print. Would you like another transaction in okay let's see str quit no that's a bad variable name str more equals input yes or no And then below that, I'm going to say if str more equals no, then break. Otherwise, they're going to say keep going. And now, let's run this thing. Okay, so I've got number of red marbles, number of blue marbles. What would you like to do? Add or take away marbles. Let's take away marbles. Oops, let's take away marbles down here. Take away, you want to take away red or blue? Blue, how many? Let's take away five. Number of red marbles is now 10. Number of blue is five. Would you like another transaction? Yes. What would you like to do? Add or take away marbles. Let's take away again. Let's take away blue and let's take away 10 from blue, which is more than we have in there. 
It says in, invalid input or insufficient marbles. Would you like another transaction? Yes. I'd like to add blue a thousand marbles. Okay, so it's keeping track as I run this. Now, if I quit this program and I rerun it, it'll go back to 10 and 10. It won't be persistent because I'm not saving it anywhere. It's just in the computer's memory right now using those variables. There's one more thing I want to show you because if I'm doing currency, if I if I have like $10, $10.00 10 and I have $1,000, $1,000.00, that doesn't look clean. It doesn't look great. And so there's a, a way to make it look a lot nicer. And that is using the R just, um, the R just string function. And so I'm going to break these up. And it's giving me an error right now because it doesn't like what I'm doing so far. Now I'm going to do this, which would print them, but still not in a nice format. Since they're integers, I have to convert them to strings in order to use a string function. So I'm going to put an str function around it. And then I'm going to say r just and 10. And now when I run this, if I add marbles, if I add them to red, even if I add multiple digits, what's going on here? What do I do differently? Something's in blue 10. Okay, those should have lined up exactly. So I'm a little confused here. Add marbles. Blue, three. Yeah, now that's really strange. Okay, so something is funky here. But what should have happened is those two numbers should have been exactly stacked on top of each other. And for some reason, it's adding another character here at the end. I can't explain it. Maybe there's a space. There shouldn't be because they, they're switched from an int. So, and there's these lines are exactly the same. Well, they're not exactly the same. Oh, that's what it is. It's because those lines are different lengths. But that shouldn't affect... Ah, I got it. It's because they're on the same line. So if I want to make this work, here's how I have to do it. Uh, just give me one second here. Okay, so the reason it, it worked out funky is because I had um, those on the same line and they weren't in fact equal. Text blue, what was I thinking? All right, so now I wanna print them out. Right, justified. Print text red. R just, and I'll use 50, no, I'll use 40. Print text blue, R 
just 40. Now let's run it. There we go. What would you like to do? Add marbles, red. Okay, so a little crowded in here. I could put a space at the end there, but you see now they line up properly. They don't line up over here. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Another way, you know, another way that I could have done that is by making these the same length. Let's just undo this and pretend like I didn't take that all apart. Okay, let's do this. I could go L just 30 on this one. What I'm doing here is I'm forcing both of these lines to be the same length. And then so it'll be a 30 plus a 10. Save. As long as both of these are less than 30 characters, this should work just fine. So let's add red 2000. Okay, so there's another way to do it. So that looks really nice. It has them spaced out. And you can imagine if I had decimal points or whatever on the side here. So those are some ways that you can format things a little bit nicer uh, using, and of course we have the center function as well for strings. So that actually mimics the ATM assignment. You can see we have a red and blue, but I could have just as easily said savings and checking. And instead of int, I should have float as the data type because we're using uh, decimals with a savings and checking account. We're not using just whole dollars, we're using dollars and cents. But other than that, a lot of this code flows that, that directly the same. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually take this code right here and put it on the Canvas site so that you can take a look at it, play around with it, reverse engineer it, and use it uh, for the creation of your ATM assignment. Um, you've got probably 30 or 35 minutes to work on this. Uh, actually, about 45 to work on this. And then um, we'll, we'll cut out here a little early today because I've got an appointment to get to. But uh, make sure you ask questions, and we'll, we can debrief a little bit on Monday if people are still struggling with it.